time is that we were able to to connect to people that we wouldn't have previously done like the bang sitting in france hook and um we have people from sedgefield and etc so i'd like to ask people to in the chat function tell us where you are um and to just give you a very warm welcome to another one of our early talks uh world Street academy is very passionate about creating a community of people who are passionate about everything od and to bring these people together, to learn together, to talk together, to debate. Um, me and Tabang were just uh, talking about um, this morning, I, I, I googled paternalistic leadership and the first thing that came up in Google was advantages. Um, and saying, yes, we have to remember that things are contextual. Um, we certainly explore different leadership styles and all the leadership development work that we do. Um, even starting with, with junior new managers up to senior executive teams. It's a very important concept. So, so Bang, we're honored to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much for, for making the time. And I'm going to hand over to you and Chris to now. Uh, I want to just invite everybody throughout to, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat function. And between me and Chris, we'll keep an eye on, on the chat function and just uh, make sure that we raise those questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Lizzo. Good morning, Good morning. everyone. Uh, please forgive the, uh, the alarm going off somewhere in my neighborhood. My neighbor has got the most paranoid Joe Berg alarm. <laughs> like a whole series of, of different sounds and noises that it uh, Tabang, uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, and good morning have, to listeners and participants. I've been uh, I've been following you around on Twitter, uh, as as I follow around a lot of people that I find interesting. Yes. And, uh, what what struck me uh, about you and and why I enjoyed following you. And also why I wanted to invite you to, to, to our early talk this morning mm -hmm. um, is your unrelenting engagement with the questions of leadership in South Africa. And, and those are not just questions of leadership in, uh, well, they are questions of leadership in government. And, and we know that we have, have severe questions of leadership in government, all across government but also uh, questions of leadership in the corporate sector in South Africa. And uh, you are the author of two books. The first book, Fit for Purpose, uh, that has received uh, some, some very interesting and, and very positive reviews about the need to bring back a sense of purpose in organizational le leadership and in organizations themselves and then the book that is, it's coming out next month, right? Um, the Unending Struggle for Relevance, uh, which, is, which is about contextual leadership and the need for leadership to be contextual. Now, I want to say to, to all our guests this morning is um, you can order both those books uh, and I'm going to put the details for all of that right in a moment, I'm going to put it in the chat box. Uh, and you will see this. You can pre-order the new book of Tabang, The Unending Struggle for Relevance, uh, at the pre-order price. And there's also a coupon that you can use when you order this that gives you even a further discount on this book. I, I do believe that Tabang, this work is incredibly important because to a massive extent, our notions of leadership is Western. It comes from the North and it comes from the USA. Uh, and it comes with a very specific historical baggage. And, and to, to a large extent, because our corporate world and our organizational world has, has borrowed so much from the West or is, 
in a way is shaped in the image of the West. Uh, it's, it sometimes you have a sense that something is imposed and there must be alternatives. There must be different ways. And, and, and I must confess my own ignorance uh, about different ways. I know um, people like Raul Koza has written a book about Ubuntu and, uh, and, and there, is a, there is writing in this domain. I, I hope that as, as we go into, into this crazy decade that we have been embarking upon, that the literature and the writing and the thinking about leadership ways and approaches to leadership and thinking about leadership, uh, that it will become more and more being led by people like yourself. So to, to get us into the conversation this morning is this conversation about patriarchal or paternalistic le leadership uh, and uh, <coughs> its limits, its ends. Um, and I'm going to, to hand over to you to, to lead us into the conversation. And as Liesl said, uh, if you have questions, please pop them into the chat function. And uh, Tabang is going to introduce us to the thinking, uh, take us through some key ideas, and then we're going to open the conversation and uh, you can ask uh, questions and, and see where this conversation takes us. Well, Tabang? thank you very much, uh, Christo. First of all, you know, uh, let me say how honored I am indeed. Uh, to be speaking to your distinguished uh, guests and, uh, and, and, and colleagues. Um, the topic, I'm sure, must be, you know, generating some, some questions and interest from a number of people. You know, why, patri you know, why paternalistic? You know, and uh, uh, why do we really talk about it especially and not any other uh, as something that we should be really bothered about in the 21st century, perhaps in the South African setting. But, uh, you know, my, my forte and uh, expertise is in organizational performance. So I, 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 I deal with that as, as, you know, as something that I do professionally. And one of the things that has always bothered me is why it is that we have allowed so much uh, performance regression in organizations in South Africa. Uh, why did we allow that? It is happening not only in the public sector or state-owned enterprises, but it also happens in the private sector. We have many stories that have occupied the lines in the past 15 years of collapses in the private sector. And when you go into the behind the scenes, really, to try to understand that, you find that it was a fault of leadership. It was leadership that just was not ready to understand what was going on. So, uh, and uh, my forays into organizations, I keep on finding the same thing. I'm invited, come and help us with strategy repositioning. You know, can we really achieve our objectives? Can we validate whether we'll be in a position from who we are to be able to achieve what we want to do? And when I look at it, I find that in fact, it is not a problem of the organization per se, it's a pro problem of leadership. And uh, I have been writing a lot about these problems in a variety of outlets. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I ultimately thought I should put this together in a book. Because a book is something that will always be there, curated for anyone to reach. Articles people find difficult to reach and access via whatever link or publication that you have used. And so that, that is the motivation for the first book. And the, the second book really is about talking concepts, uh, the intersection between concepts and application. Uh, that's what it is all about. Now, my approach this morning, I thought, let's just talk about, you know, the, 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 the framework I have developed, which I believe can really open gateways to understanding a variety of interpretations 
of leadership styles or leadership forms in any contextual setting. Now, if you go to my website under what you call Taba Mutsui Life Lessons, you'll find this, 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 this you know, uh, framework. Uh, it's something that I would like to call coming out of the uh, cold face, as it were. You know, it's an experience, and therefore I, I worked out of this, uh, you know, this, 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 this framework, which is important for me now. Let's take it step by step and slowly, so that we can unpack it in these varieties, in the various uh, implications. The framework reads as follows. No leader has ever emerged out of a vacuum. And, and that, I think, is self-evident in the sense that we are social beings and therefore live in the context of groups, societies, etc., uh, anywhere in the world. And therefore, that's what it means. No leader has ever emerged out of a vacuum. There's always a setting. The second part, second sentence in this framework says, leadership is always shaped by emergent challenges and is purpose driven. Now, we'll get into this component of, of this framework and try to unpack it. The last part of it says, however, the continuing challenge for mankind, uh, uh, for the human cause, is to ensure that the purpose is and remains ethical. Now, I would like to unpack these, these, uh, these, uh, the, you know, two of these. Uh, as I said, the first one I've already, you know, dealt with because it's about context, which, you know, it's, it's there. Uh, you know, it's within society. Now, when we talk about leadership, is always shaped by emerging challenges. We're talking about complexity. Challenges happen within a system. That system can be a family, can be groups in society, can be, you know, uh, nations or whatever. Now, any system will always have a variety of factors that affect it, small or big. Some of these may have more impact and effect on a system than others, but in any system, even a small factor can upset a system in such a manner that, you know, you, you, the whole system is destabilized and then reset. It can be disruptive, it can be imagined. Now, leadership is, a, you know, challenges therefore emerge out of a complex system. Uh, uh, and in a dynamic context, any system always is in a dynamic context. Uh, our societies, uh, the country South Africa, is within an African context. The African context is within, is within the global context. There are things that outside that come in and affect, and we have no control over them. We we have a very painful understanding of that now uh, through the you know the coronavirus. So that is the essence of a system that gets transformed by factors that are sometimes beyond your control, but at times within your control. So basically then, leadership, what I'm saying is that it's always a response to these challenges. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about leadership for a soccer club or a group of uh, academics or, or whatever, you'll always be responding to, to challenges. Uh, otherwise, it would be difficult to imagine a society that does not have needlings and uh, discomforts. Uh, it's always peaceful. Even in the monarchies, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, everywhere else, you have these disturbances. That's why you always have what you call sessions for meditation and quiet, so that you are there to go and reflect and see how you can reflect, you know, resolve these issues that disturb the peace in such a manner that people will learn from it. So, so leadership is always a response. And uh, you will see in, in, in the book, you know, that's, that, that's something that comes very special, uh, you know, under leadership, because they were trying to show indigenous leadership. Uh, I'm trying to, sh to show indigenous leadership 
that responded to a situation. You know, Mushasha did not just come out of out of a vacuum. Uh, his father, you know, made sure that he goes into what he call leadership coaching to prepare him for a, a future, which he, the father couldn't predict. But those were the times of the the wars of of expansion. The war uh, leaders felt they become strong if they assume more others under their control, territorial expansion control, uh, and so on. So, so, so you emerge out of that situation. Uh, Mandela also, you know, was responding to a situation. When he decided he's going to focus on national unity, you know, it was because he realized if we don't focus on that, it may disturb everything else. So it is a response. Uh, and all of them are always responding. Policy in government is about a response to social issues. Now, all social formations are complex systems, as I have said, you know, uh, and so, and they form a basis, therefore, from which leaders actually, you know, emerge. Now, a response in any situation, when it happens, must always be for a purpose. You don't just respond and say, look, you know, oh, there's a challenge, I'm going in. Why? Why are you going to that challenge? Why are you trying to solve that challenge? What is the purpose? What for? It is the motivation <clears throat> behind it that makes you decide that I'm going to do this and that and that and the other. Now, the, the question becomes then, what type of leader do you pick or choose at a particular time for a particular challenge? And this is very, very important for organizations. And this is something that I've come to realize uh, is, is, is a great weakness among organizations. Uh, the question, for instance, can be, uh, we need a new CEO. Uh, at what point in the life cycle of an organization do you need that particular CEO? What kind of CEO do you want? Where is the organization at that time? What are the challenges that the organization is facing? And therefore, what sort of skills do you want from such a leader? Right? And these are important questions that I find in organizations are always overlooked. And now, uh, one of the stage, I mean, things that I'll be that I'm mentioning is that. You know, selecting a leader can be a very risky, risky assignment for boards. And it can be very ruinous in terms of costs if you make the wrong choices. Therefore, you have to be very careful to understand the state of organizational development at which you want a particular type of leader. And you have to ensure that you get the right type of uh, you know, professional advice in terms of testing all the applicants to ensure that they exhibit the sort of qualities uh, and skills of leadership that you require. Now, uh, leadership style really, it's, it's a pattern or a set of attitudes that leaders hold, uh, you know, and, and the behaviors that, that leaders, you know, exhibit. It's as simple as that. So, from this statement, therefore, one can come to the conclusion that uh, a leadership style is a product of context and culture. So, so, so culture has a very great influence in terms of shaping the style and the attitude of a leader. Uh, and so is context, which now takes us into, you know, interesting leadership paradigms uh, when you think about it from that perspective because now you 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 you, you begin to to see that if indeed as it is proved now that culture is also a special determinant of leadership style then why should you go and learn about the american uh, aggressive leadership style in order to come in 
manage situations in South Africa or Botswana or any other place? Are we not victims really of the American hegemony? You know, in trying to understand how organizations uh, are run. And remember, America or the US was formulated on a very highly competitive environments. Competition drove behavior. And therefore, success in winning is, is a culture. Now, in the African context, you have a different approach. You have what you call Ubuntu, you know, uh, concern for the others. Uh, how do you manage that? And this is why now in my title, I talk about the special case of South Africa because South Africa presents a fascinating case, uh, you know, in the types of leadership challenges uh, and experiments that we, we, we are facing. And I'll talk about that uh, because it is, it is really at the heart of this discussion. But you see, the way I'm trying to bring that about is that we should talk conceptually and then move on to application. Now, the, the, if you look into the history of human beings, since the beginning of times, when human beings started organizing themselves into families, into groups, into societies, into communities, etc., the biggest danger in those contexts was competition for space with other living entities, like animals. Uh, the distinguishing thing is that we have the brains to decide where we want to go and how to manage our environments. They only act on the basis of impulse. If I see you, then I have to eat you. And this is something that we have been doing as societies ever. We've been trying to protect the environments in which we are, to create comfort. Uh, in order to improve our lifestyles and grow. And uh, for some reason, you know, the creator decided to provide man or the male species with more physical strength and therefore assumed that role of protecting the family, which was composed of wife, children, and society from all these dangers that we've always been faced with from time immemorial, since the beginning of time. Now, the male species therefore has always been protective. That's where the patriarchy comes in. That's where the paternalistic thing comes in. Now, if you look into the development of societies then over time, from, pre, uh, from the medieval, the pre-medieval, the Egyptian time, the Greek times, the, you know, the, the Roman uh, times, you find the growth of male expressionism in control of the environment, right? Uh, the wars of uh, domination, territorial expansion, etc. They're all about, you know, expanding the control, expanding the society, the group, nations, etc. Where uh, you know, uh, put under control of others that were totally unrelated to them. That's what the Romans did. They had a huge empire. That's, where, that's the beginning of the empire. And it is all about extraction and control and so on. And the people that were up front in doing all these things are the male species. Okay? And in those days and throughout time, if you are a student of history, you'll know that the most admired person was the one who really exhibited tough qualities in leadership style. We hero worship such people. And uh, this is where it becomes very interesting from a leadership point of view. Uh, because what has been changing over time is that contexts have changed. And the driving force for change has always been technology and the speed of information or communication. You know, that has been the driving motive for change. Now, the only thing that has happened faster in the past 
10 decades, so in the first century or so, there's always been the speed of information. In the last five decades, we've seen the fastest ever, you know, speed of information exposed to us. And this has been extremely disruptive. And so societies have been disrupted from their comfort zones because of intrusion of other ideas, like other cultural understandings of situations that may conflict with the situation where, for instance, for instance, people have migrated to, etc., and so on. That is the reality of the world as we have it. Now, the danger to the patriarchal type of leadership of command and control is precisely the speed of information. Because what it does, it, 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 it provides people with alternative sources of knowledge, all right? And when you have an alternative source of knowledge, you don't necessarily have to be beholden to the one who, is, who has to be having a superior, you know, a physical power of force over you. That is a, 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 a very interesting part. Now, let me just move quickly into the situation of South Africa. And this is where I find this exceptionally interesting. Uh, in the sense that the life, the leadership style of command and control is generally understood globally. It is quietly accepted globally, but it has been in, it has been receding. It has been under attack, you know, as the female or, you know, as women get into positions of leadership. And as the work environments change, because we have been moving from what you call the heavy industry into the high tech industry that requires less of physical strength, but more of brain power. That opened the gates for women. So basically, you know, the interesting thing about this understanding and study of leadership is that the male species actually has been pretty naughty for hundreds and hundreds of centuries, you know, in the sense that they, they assumed the franchise for themselves mm. in the churches uh, all over the place and uh, uh, slowly opened the, the valves for women to come in when it suited them. All right. So, 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 so this is why you find resistance to this change. In the South African case, what you see is uh, uh, a situation where something that is not evil, or, or but you may call ubiquitous globally, which is command and control, was then used in the South African situation as part of what you call command, dominant command and control of one race over the other. So the command and control, you know, got meshed into the apartheid state, into the mechanism, into the way the apartheid state control the environment. If you look into recent research, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll name the, the guy who did the, his PhD on the role of the church and the brutal bonds and how the Africana managed uh, to make such a success of the Africana, BE, Africana economic empowerment, uh, AEE, is that the church played a very significant role. The Bruder Bond played a very significant role. You have what you call a monoculture, all right? Uh, a very conservative monoculture uh, with Calvinistic, uh, you know, uh, overhang over it. In that situation, it is easy to mold people in a particular mode of thinking, all right? Uh, obedience is part of the culture of the Africana, all right? Command and control is part of the understanding. Now, I've had to study that, I've had to understand that. And I, fortunately, you know, even though I left South Africa when I was in 1962, uh, but, you know, and came back only in 1994, I've interacted and uh, learned and understood the Africana culture. Uh, it, it becomes very interesting because the Africana political elite were mainly male. 
right? And they were highly educated. Uh, the others were middle class, but these are the political elite. And how you get into that station, you have to go through the Brudebund, or you have to be really qualified to be there. So if you look at the all the well-known leaders of business in South Africa, whether it was in the state or private sector who are African, they had that culture, you know? Uh, they had that culture of command. Uh, if you look at their offices, they're always right at the top, top floor of buildings. Now, coming into Transnet in 1994, as it were, and for me, you know, a little bit of a cultural shock, but I understood that having been exposed internationally, I was already a highly experienced, uh, you know, uh, leader at that time. If you take, for instance, uh, Spornet, what you used to call Spornet, I, I tended around what we now call freight train. It used to be uh, managed, uh, the leader there was one very famous uh, Bram, Bram, Bram Leroux. Now, Bram was a formidable engineer. Uh, now, he had, his own, he had his own lift in the building. It was his office on the, right at the top. He had a, a cook, you know, in the office. You remember, if you used to travel second class or first class in the trains in those days, remember those guys in black suits and uh, uh, white shirts, etc. He had a guy like that that was looking after him, and no one else rode into that. And uh, when you were called into the top floor, uh, all others and remember, rail, rail was mainly Africana. The respect, it was godly. Now, Bram, I was now the chief of strategy for the whole of, of, uh, of, 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 of Transnet. So he had to have a special relationship with me. And I think he quickly re realized that this is a different person. Uh, you know, he's not young and uh, he's, he's been exposed. And ultimately, Bram and I became very friendly, you know. Uh, it, it, it was a, many other Africaners used to come and ask, but how did you manage to penetrate Bram such an expect? He respects you so much. That was a big question. Now, let's go back to this situation where the globally uh, diminishing concept of command and control. In South Africa, it assumed a different you know, a franchise. It became hated precisely because, by the majority of black people, because it was used as an instrument of oppression. So rather than isolated, it was actually enmeshed in the philosophy of apartheid. Now, what do you have then? What you have then, you find the, the leadership style of the indigenous black people of always going out, inclusiveness, etc., was left out there, was not, was not brought in. Which was just, you know, key style, for instance, was one of inclusiveness. He had what you call a lehutla, uh, people around him, advisory council. And his council would rule against him. And he would agree and implement that. Now, that is very unusual in the African tradition. The king is the final word. Now we introduce this question of a chief is a chief because of the will of the people. Now that is something that was that is totally different in the Africana culture. Now, when we went through the transition, you have a situation where uh, the, the, the arms of the state or the state entities were run for a particular purpose, were conceived for a particular purpose. The African was clear about that. Uh, in this PhD research, you know, this is precisely what this guy was researching about. I'll get the name before we go. And, uh, and, and they achieved their objectives. But post in the democratic state, we have never really defined what these entities are. And this has been my, my discussion in my first book and even in my second book. What are they there for? What is the purpose? 
of each of these. Because when you have defined that, you are in a position now to say, then what type of leadership do we need for these? The experience we have had so far, I think everybody understands that from all sectors, is that we have undergone a regression of state system, a regression of the state-owned entities for the past 15 years. If you look at ESCOM, for instance, you'll find that there's been something like 10 uh, chief executives in 10 years or 12 years. Uh, the boards have changed as quickly as a new minister comes into position. And the composition of the board had nothing to do with the entity which they were supposed to oversee in terms of qualification. Now, this is what the problem is, because you see, if we say that uh, leadership style is a product of culture and context, then South Africa is in a fluid state. Because first, black people rejected command and control. And the white didn't understand inclusiveness and Ubuntu. We're all trying now to find out what is, what is, the, more, what is the more acceptable, reflective uh, uh, system of leadership and style that we need to put in place. The last 15 years in the SOEs, for, for example, shows you that we have been battling and failed abysmally. If you go to the private sector, you have examples again there, just for instance, you know, Steinhoff. Uh, you, you need to, to, to know the person and understand the person to see what happened. Just is a very, very dictatorial kind of character, uh, you know, very suited for command and control. So it was his word or nothing. Even the board, he was able to marshal and mobilize the board whichever direction that he wanted to, even though they may dis, you know, disagree, some of them. But basically, he managed to, 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 to manipulate them, therefore, into a position that was going to work for him. Now, there are many examples like that in the private sector. Uh, uh, for instance, if you take, if you take Edgar's, the sorry state of the decline of Edgar's. It is because it was totally, totally unaware of what was happening around itself, even though it had an external uh, manager, you know, who was required to come and turn the thing around. You can bring as many examples as, as you can, uh, but that is a story that I try to bring up in the book, that context and culture determines or determine leadership attitudes and style. And therefore, when you want to re refresh your leadership in any organization, you have to be in a position to say, where are we in the life cycle of this organization? What do we want to achieve next? What type of leadership style do we want? or will suit or be able to give us the solutions that we desire as the board and as the rest of the organization. Then how do we identify such a leader? Because you must remember in the context of the South African labor law regime and jurisprudence, if you make a mistake there, it is going to be very costly for you to reverse it and correct it. In the US, it's pretty easy. You just call a board meeting and you fire the guy and it's gone. So the word fire is a European, or sorry, it's an American term. In South Africa, it's a different thing altogether. It's like in Germany, you don't, it's not easy to, or Belgium, it's not easy to just get rid of people. In France, it's extremely difficult. That's why it takes so, such a long time to fill a position in, in France, like it does happen in South Africa, because you want to be absolutely careful, you know, otherwise you get laden with a burden that you can't remove from your shoulders. So, what am I saying? What I'm saying is that we are in a flux situation and uh, it is the essence of what I'm trying to, to, to put together now. This will be for book three. Uh, how do we really uh, understand the situation we are in and therefore decide carefully what type of leadership we want? This question 
is suitable uh, applies also to the political side. You know, what type of leader do you get or to choose? What are the metrics for that? What is the driving value system behind that? And uh, we're faced with that situation at this point in time. And we're struggling to really understand how to select. And we're struggling because the two uh, ideologies, not ideologies, paradigms, are at conflict. Okay? Uh, the, the one of inclusiveness is not truly and clearly understood. The one of command and control is being rejected outright in South Africa. And yet, it applies in the US. It applies in Japan. You know, it applies successfully in China. All right? So, so it even applies in the UK. Uh, th th these are what you call paradoxes uh, of leadership. Uh, you know, how do we navigate all these difficult things? Now, what is happening to come down to, to closure is that what is happening is that a lot of researchers and there are many researchers in this field are trying to understand now what is the preferred way of leadership style. We, we, we have new things coming up, things like, you know, the meta skills of a leader uh, under the current, in the 21st century, in a very highly dynamic uh, and complex context. The meta skills of a leader, uh, you know, there are those that are now punting for awareness. A leader that to require in the current context must be aware. What I call in my book, you know, contextual intelligence. Because if you don't have that contextual intelligence to understand the movements of the different parts in the system, in the complex system, you'll find yourself facing a disaster, right? If you recall the meeting uh, that was called by uh, the CEO of Nokia, uh, when Microsoft now was taking over, and he called his uh, group of executives together uh, and said, look, you know, we have all been having parties here and enjoying ourselves thinking that we were successful. And we were not because the world was moving under our feet and we're enjoying momentary success. And this is the problem, especially in the private sector. Uh, Edcord Group is a very typical example of this. They thought they were successful, they were paying dividends and they were meeting their bond repayments. The world was moving. The new, the new uh, fashion kings were coming into the territory and eating their breakfast right in front of their eyes. So, so, so now this, this is the dilemma that we have at the current moment. What do we do? How do we navigate this paradoxes? Now, this concept of the meta skill of awareness is gaining ground. But there is also something else, you know, you call, uh, Lizelle talked about something else that we call transformational leaders, for instance. Uh, uh, others are called, you know, all sorts of things. There are so many terms. I've just been finishing a paper that I'm trying to go through right now that is talking about the different terms of leadership styles. And the question is, where do you apply these things? And if you look at them, 80% of them originate from the US. We are not paying attention to our own inheritance and preferences and context to develop a style of leadership that is suitable for our environment. And I dare say South Africa is a typical example where we have to find a way of doing this effectively so that we can, when we talk about identifying an effective leader, we have identified these driving points. That's what I'm trying to work on now. What are these driving points in the South African scenario that are so important to each one of our different cultures that we have to take into account in trying to formulate them? For instance, if you have a, a question like, uh, you know, we need a new vice chancellor for Stellenbosch or whatever university. What type of qualities are you looking for? In an environment where that university has changed so much, what are you looking for there? 
Can a professor of philosophy be a good administrator of Stellenbosch? Can a professor of psychology become a very good administrator of UCT or even University of Western Cape or University of Johannesburg? What I'm saying is that there have been serious shifts in context because what you're seeing in these entities is a huge migration into the universities by people that were not there previously, who are now in the majority who come from different parts with different cultures and cultural values. How then do you make uh, the, 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 how then do you run such spaces in order to give sufficient spaces for each of these to develop themselves successfully? I was involved in trying to, and you'll find this chapter in, in my new book, uh, one of the universities, uh, 2010, I think it was. And, and it is very, very interesting if you look at the university, uh, the, 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 the university next to uh, the Vile University of Technology. Right? Sorry, sorry about that. Located in a highly engineering environment, Sasso, yeah, Asal Mittal, and so on engines, trains, everything around there. You would expect, therefore, that such universities should produce uh, great engineers, you know, highly skilled engineers, and so on. But then when I ask them a simple question, what are the requirements of the industries around you? And when did you test for these? I couldn't get it. We had to do our own investigation into the requirements of these industries and match those against the offerings of the university. So, so what I'm trying to show and point is that the selection of the vice chancellor is not as easy and as, as we think it could be. Do you need, what do you mean when you say vice, I mean, the head of university vice chancellor must have contextual intelligence of the entity that she or he is going to answer. Who is that person? If they don't come from the Val area. Who is that person if you're going to be the Western Cape, University of Western Cape Vice Chancellor, when you hardly understand what has been happening in the Western Cape or the Northwest? I'm not saying these are criteria for exclusion, but they are criteria for careful consideration if you want to get that vice chancellor to succeed. So context, uh, culture, play a very important part in determining the outlook of a leader in a highly dynamic and continually dynamic complex society. So the, West, the University of Western Cape is totally different from the value University of technology, no, no, even the Northwest University, because they are within different contexts. So this is my thesis, and uh, uh, you know I'll welcome any discussion on this, and I hope uh, I've been understood. Uh, you know, there is nothing absolutely correct about this, uh, and uh, I'm learning as much as all of us are learning, and uh, it would be a great pleasure to get feedback from any one of you guys. Uh, we'll see how this book will turn out in about two to three years uh, that I'm working on, except that I have to fight, you know, to make sure that I stay young in the process. <laughs> Thank you, Lizelle, and uh, Christo, I await uh, uh, engagement. Thank you, Tabang. That, that is fascinating, and I think you, you raised so many, uh, so many points that provide direction for, for lots of exploration. Early in the early in your um, in your talk, you you refer to male and female styles and and the, the the rise of the paternalistic or the patriarchal. And I think there's a there's a huge line of exploration there, and especially uh, you know as we see the COVID response in uh, the COVID response in across the world and. Uh, 
quite a few people that that made a point of pointing out that the countries that are doing well are led by women. Mm -hmm. And now I don't know if that's a direct correlation, etc. But there's there's something to be explored there. There's there's something different yes. happening there. Um, yeah. And your 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 really intriguing point about the South African situation, contextually, historically, uh, and the, and the two major styles uh, that we have both somehow lost, uh, or you know, the command and control style because of its association and and its use in South Africa, and then um, curious for me why 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 we have not managed to to find uh, a South African style and 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 again as i said at the beginning um you know pleading my own ignorance or confessing to my own ignorance is um is that so many of us working in this field uh, are still working with european models or uh, western models and we don't know enough about what could possibly be uh, what emerges here in our context and of course as you mentioned it needs to be em emerging so, so, so those are just some brief responses to that. There has been a, a, a question from Soli uh, about Ubuntu, and he yes. asks how widespread it is and in, in, in on the continent, and uh, is it interpreted in different ways? Are there different names for it? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Soli. It's good to see to, to see that you, you are in attendance too. Uh, Soli, Soli is just a few, a few, uh, shall we say, minutes from here, but you can't even see each other. We've been threatening to see each other, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure we'll find time. Uh, yes, the, the question of uh, Ubuntu is, is, is quite well spread, especially in the East African part of, of, of Africa. Um, you find there's a lot of uh, common understanding of it. Yeah. And it comes from the African communalism type of uh, structure of society. Uh, but, you know, to what extent it is being used in, in state governance or even in uh, the governance of organizations is something that I think is more researched or being researched in South Africa than many other places. And uh, for a simple reason that uh, in South Africa, the, 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 the transition has been so uh, disruptive <clears throat> and driven by such divergent interests that we're all struggling to, to try to find exactly, you know, what is the best way. This is the reason why in my book, I, I've tried to expose another way. Uh, and uh, that is the the way Musha should try to deal with this question. What can we learn from there? Uh, there's nothing prescriptive. What can we learn from there? Uh, but I think we are on the road towards that in South Africa in the sense that this thing of consultation is there, except I, I would like to believe that currently we are overdoing it in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, instead of <laughs> decisions being taken, everything is to cons goes into consensus building. Uh, uh, which I believe is a, is a luxury that you may not be able to enjoy at this point in time when we are at a juncture where we require difficult decisions to be taken. But that's my short answer, Sully. Uh, and um, uh, you know, I, I would like to open myself to to supplement information on that. Christina, uh, I, I see you have um, raised a question um, that you have not uh, um, completed. Uh, would you like to speak and ask your question? Hi, um, yes, sorry. I, I completed it on the next part of the uh, I 
pressed enter before I could finish typing. Tabang, thank you. Brilliant thoughts. Just the, on the point of leadership and vulnerability, I think um, I pick up that as leaders, we tend to be, uh, to deny ourselves to be out there. And um, I see it as an impediment in terms of leadership in my space. And I'm not sure what is your view in that regard. That's very important and uh, a current Oops, we lost Taban for a moment there. I'm sure he'll come back. Uh, it seems like the Cape Weather is playing havoc with the connection as well. If it is only the Cape Weather. Well, uh, our, our systems are not that used to handling the snow, hey? Yeah. <laughs> I see, I see, um, uh, uh, I see, Christina, thank, thank you for that point. I think let's wait for uh, Tabang when he, when he returns about that. I do see also a conversation emerging more deeply about um, Ubuntu. Nathaniel, there was um, some, uh, a point that you made about the discarding of Nyerere. And uh, I'm not completely familiar with that history. Is that a history of of in the African context, not paying serious attention to uh, Ubuntu, letting go of the concept of Ubuntu? Uh, thank you, thank you, Roy. Um, thank you, Daban. It has been a very interesting discussion that you brought here. I, I picked up uh, quite, a, there is quite a number of things that you have, or, or, or of uh, parts of issues that you have talked about which need a uh, really detailed discussion. However, I just picked up this point of Ubuntu and African leadership. And I think that's the main theme that you're trying to bring in. And Roy, you picked it up. That uh, how have we failed to develop our own leadership, our own leadership styles that fit into our, our situation. And uh, I like very much this idea of going back to our leaders like... Uh, uh, what we have seen with uh, here in South Africa and the whole world recognizes of the leadership of, um, uh, of Nelson Mandela. We talk of Nyerere, but I'm saying here, here if you listen to the, to the media and so on, the discussion about Nyerere and communi African communism or socialism for that matter, it was completely discarded. And Ubuntu was the depth even I'm Tanzanian, or maybe for those who I have not met, I'm Tanzanian. And for me, and for many of us Tanzanians, what, Tanzanians, what, we, what still holds the country together is this uh, deep feeling for others. And leadership right now is what is sorting out. If you look at emotional intelligence, empathy, and which is which um, uh, you talked about when you when you talked about Mosre uh, Mosre. Uh, it, it's it's the it's the empathy thinking of others. It is about always having the the understanding of others. Now that was the basis of African uh, socialism, and I'm not saying we should go back to to socialism. This is not my point. It's the leadership style which. Uh, is which can be understood in the African context. I completely agree of, of these paradigms that we, we, we are in a fluid situation, caught in between. We are in transition. That would be the word I would use. We are in transition. And, uh, and I think that, that you brought up very well. But then what is the kind of leadership that we need to hold in transition when even the institutions that we are leading are not African. We inherit it. Uh -huh. uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Uh... Yes, yes, there was a little bit of a problem. So I missed two questions, but I, I got halfway through the, the gentleman that has just spoken. Uh, I, I, can you hear me now? Am I connected? Yes. 
Yeah. Tavang, yes. Can I, can I ask that we, that we stick for a moment with the Ubuntu question? And then uh, uh, go back to uh, Christina's question around vulnerability. It, it seems they, they're linked in some way uh, as well, uh, in terms of the qualities that we bring to, to the conversation. In fact, uh, if, you can, if you hear me, I would like to deal with these two questions. Yes. Uh, because the question of vulnerability is so important. I was about to say when I got cut out, uh, you know, was it Christina who asked that question about vulnerability? I can't remember. Yes, it was Christina. Uh, that's right. The, the, the current bias within the context of, you know, the 21st century and the context of, uh, you know, organizations in highly dynamic environments is that a successful leader must have, as I said, a meta meta of awareness. Awareness assumes that first you have, you'll be a humble leader, another one of the terms that they use. A humble leader, and a humble leader does not fear to go down and interact and find out and identify people that you can talk to into the organization uh, in order to see who has different ideas, who, have who has complementary ideas, and so on. That is the kind of leader that they're talking about now, a leader who is humble. And you, 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 you'll show be in a position to make this kind of uh, description in the academic literature, uh, humble, transformational, etc. But underpinning all of that is the question of uh, uh, awareness. Now, if you are aware, here is an important thing. Awareness means self-awareness in the first place. You must be self-aware as to your limitations as a human being. And then be able to understand the potential and limitations of others. And be humble to confer and consult with them, see? So the, the, the Ubuntu approach of inclusiveness and consultation covers all that because you can't do those consultations if you are a narcissistic fellow, you know? You have to be somebody who is humble, who can able be to go down and listen to others. Now, uh, gentleman that has just spoken, who said he was Tanzanian, I couldn't get the name because I was out of the loop at that time, was speaking about that. Oh, Nathaniel, yes, thank you so much. Uh, was speaking about that, and yes, indeed, this is what I'm trying to, 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 to promote now. I'm saying, uh, let's be sensitive to these external instruments that we use to manage organizations. Be sure that the leaders that we choose are those that understand our contextual issues here. Now, this is the space that I'm doing a lot of work on with organizations, you know, uh, determining and understanding where they are, what type of leader they want. As to what they do after that, no, no, I'm not involved there. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you call recruiting, I mean, you know, organizations do, the, the, the Spencers and, and so on and so on. Uh, but I find the danger, the danger lies in understanding exactly where the company is, what the nature of the business of the company is, and therefore what type of, uh, you know, leader it wants. In the new book, you know, the, 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 the Unending Struggle for Relevance, I talk sharply about that, especially chapter one, and I urge people to please navigate through chapter one carefully, because it really shows you that unless you understand the organization, the discipline that is required, it will be difficult for you to choose the right type of leader who has to be there. So, 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 so I'm trying to anchor it there because that, that is the foundation of success to be able to appoint. And by the way, when you have made these appointments, unlike in the past, leaders don't find themselves spending two decades in the position of leadership in organizations. 
You are there for a short purpose, short period and purpose, five, ten years, and you must be out. Because how can you be in an organization for more than that time in a leadership position, in a context which is dynamic, changing, and facing so many different threats that are changing themselves, and that require new knowledge to understand those threats, to understand the demands of the customers, the changing demands of the customers, even the demands of the stakeholders and employees. No brain can do all of this alone. So you have to think about how do you strengthen that leader? Uh, do you put one or two people to support the leader? If you really think that he's such a special person? The danger we've always had is that the single-minded approach to leadership in South Africa, which is a peculiarity of command and control, has led to dangerous decisions. Steinhoff is one of them. Okay? Because you have dominant character there who did everything, decided on everything. And you find the same thing in many, I'm just using Steinhoff as an example. There are many others like that. Uh, in ESCO, it was exactly the same thing, you know? So, so SAA, exactly the same thing. So I'm saying uh, uh, Transnet, typically, which I know very closely, uh, because I've even worked with them very recently. So you find that type of approach, and I'm saying it is a dangerous approach. Okay. Among this, uh, um, uh, I think what you say starts in the... Out for me. <laughs> uh, I think uh, what you said ties in beautifully with a quote that, uh, that Ingrid posted from Professor Robert, Robert Sobukwe that says true leadership demands complete subjugation of self, honesty and integrity, uprightness of character, courage and fearlessness, and above all a consuming love for one's people. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so. This, um, uh, I want to go on to another comment from, from Ingrid, but uh, Kobus also um, uh, Kobus mentioned uh, situational leadership and, uh, and then the, yes. it raises the question if there's perhaps a need for a little bit of balance bringing back command, in, command and control in spaces where it may be lacking. Kobus and I, I think specifically in spaces uh, you would probably say where, where it's lacking. Uh, I guess in other command and control spaces, the opposite is true, that the opposite is like, or that, that a more inclusive uh, leadership style is lacking. I, I also want to ask Tabang on, in follow-up on Kobus's question, uh, is um, yes. situational leadership, I, I mean the way that situational leadership came to us from the US is situational leadership is still the properties and the qualities of the single hero leader. Uh, it is uh, rather than it is rather than it is the different, complete different possibilities of different kinds of leadership and leaders for different situations. I mean, with yes. In a way, with situational leadership, we still expect the same leader to be different, different to show up in different ways in the different contexts. Kobus, any comments? You see, the, the, yes, the, the difficulty that I have with with this situational leadership and the like is that uh, organizations and contemporary organizations now are global in nature. And uh, if they're not global, they have global stakeholders. If they don't have global stakeholders, they also have global employees. Right. Now, how do, you, how do you then apply that situational, situational leadership? In a situation, in an instance like this, where you're dealing with people all over the world. Now, if you read about the SAB story, <clears throat> Adam, in the US when he moved over there after they bought out the American company. It's a fabulous story that I would like to, to, to suggest you access when you go to ft.org. Uh, FT 
transformation or something like that. Yeah, the camp is making it hard for us. Uh, read about the the of oh, really uh, on the cultural preferences and biases in the shaping of organizations. Um, uh, no, no, we have indeed lost uh, Taban for a moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see, yeah, but I can see you now. Uh, there you are, Tabang. We we missed uh, we we missed probably the last minute or so of what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what <clears throat> what I was saying is that organizations, contemporary organizations, uh, you may find that within an organization, you have a subsidiary, which is global, under an organization which is indigenous. Mm. I, I, I. I can see Lizelle. I'm not so sure whether. Can you we can see me? We can hear you now. Yes. You can hear me now. So I hope I covered that uh, question. I can see Lizelle. I hope I covered that uh, beginning to disappear. Lizelle, are you with me? You're back now, but it was a, a lot of scrambled um, words <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, let me try again. What I'm trying to say is that many companies now, what you might call indigenous companies, may have subsidiaries which are global. And that brings into question the type of leadership that you have to engage to manage such situations. It is not easy. It's not, it's not easy. Um, Tabang, there's a, um, there's a provocative point from Ingrid. Uh, Ingrid, I don't know if you want to speak. Okay. Uh, are you still there? Yes, there you are, Ingrid. Uh, around um, the concept of Ubuntu getting hijacked yeah, it, and by sort of like a, a certain kind of white... white no, no, no. I, I, can, I can hear you What is the provocative question from Ingrid? Ingrid, you want to speak to it? Um, thank you so much. I'm loving what you're saying. Um, what, what I've noticed in some of the work that I've done and uh, speaking to critical race theorists, um, I don't know if you know Nyasham Boti, I don't know if you know uh, Jade Goodwin, some people doing some interesting um, work. And in my conversations, these are some of the things that I'm hearing and seeing. So the concept of Ubuntu and along with that, a similar kind of rainbow nation, everyone is lovely and we all love each other, um, has been hijacked by quite a regressive um, ideology, which is let's just forget the past and take what we like that is comfortable to us and there's almost a kind of historical erasure that goes with it and um, a denialism. So in the gender space, it would be, oh, you so angry women, get over it. Women have equality now and you're being divisive. And a, and a, a kind of um, analogical, I don't know if I'm using the right word, thing happens in race that um, it's, uh, let's forget race, you're being divisive, 
let's rather use the concept of Ubuntu. And I, I kind of think of this as a form of epistemic injustice. It's a gaslighting and invalidation of people's frustration and anger and um, a, f a refusal to recognize kind of persistent coloniality. So, okay, I've said enough, I'm rambling. Well, look, Ingrid, you're raising, <clears throat> you're raising a, a few very important issues in my vocabulary. Uh, the question of epistemic injustice, uh, you know, is there and there is a tendency to try to, to, to minimize it. Okay, let's take a look at, for instance, the U.S. scenario. If you look at the number of universities in the U.S. now, have programs uh, that were never there 10 years ago uh, of equality, of uh, black studies, of uh, gender equality. Uh, a lot of material has come out of this. Now, these are no more than 10 years old. Now, what I've understood from social anthropology is that, you know, attitudes are generational questions. Uh, they take time to cultivate and therefore they take time to dislodge. Uh, but it doesn't mean that because of that, <clears throat> you should then moderate your effort to change them. You must not moderate your effort to change them, but you must understand that they take time. Okay, let me give for instance, let's go on a nuclear micro, micro level. In my family, uh, you know, the, my children, <clears throat> my children's perspective of the world is very global. Uh, my, my grandchildren, even my grandchild right now, who is about 20, thinks globally. He tells me that he wants to go and live in Germany. And I'm saying, now who's going to look after your grandpa? He says, no, that's easy. I'll be online with you every day. Then I said, but I want to feel you. I want he says, no, but grandpa, I'll be with you. And if there's anything, I'll, I'll take my jet and fly and, and, and come and see. Now, if a child is already thinking of, I'll have my jet to come and see you, that's a different type of thinking, okay? Now, if you look into the South African situation of these uh, gender-based violence, you know, equality, uh, exclusion, and so on, all of these will take, a, must take, in fact, a concerted effort by societal uh, organizations to remind, you know, the political level that these are issues to be legislated for, to be catered for, to be budget for, budgeted for, and to be pursued. The problem that I see is that we don't make sufficient noise in South Africa about these issues like the, they've been doing in the US. It is a question of development, I think. It's a question of accessibility of communications. You know, uh, not many people have access to, to data uh, or to the telephone. So, so in the US, we might get to a situation where it is ubiquitous, all right, uh, through the cell phone and so on. But I'm beginning to see a different mindset. Uh, even though one might say this mindset that I'm talking about at universities has a high degree of anger in it, all right? And justifiable anger because of that epistemological, you know, logical neglect that you, you referred to earlier. So, so I think it will take time, but we must never, never reduce the level of intensity of advocation. Advocacy must be there. It is the only thing that has changed perception in the world, in my view. Thank you, Taban. That's, a, that's an interesting question because uh, in the in the question around leadership and what kind of leadership we need, the, the question also yes. arises: what is what is a just organisation? And 
and uh, are our organizations just uh, not just uh, and I guess that's that's a big part of the con if you speak about the where we need a, a kind of leadership to emerge that can actually deal with this as our context is a context of of injustice uh, and structural legacies. You're raising you're raising another another important question, <clears throat> and uh, it, there is a there is a chapter that deals with that uh, in a way in one of the uh, test cases that I'm talking about in the book. But the the kind of leader that I'm saying is be emerging to be the preferred leader, the leader who of broad awareness, the leader with level of contextual intelligence, the leader who is humble and who will be able to go into the levels of the organization and start with people. It is that type of leader then who will be able to be sensitive to structural injustice within the organization as well as beyond. One of the problems that I have seen uh, with many organizations is that You'll find uh, where you have groups that do work like gangs, you know, installations and so on. And uh, with a leader who happens maybe because of historical reasons is white because they were highly qualified, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I found that if you ask this person, do you know the names of your gang? Yes, he, he may know. Do you know their living circumstances? No. Do you know whether these people come to work motivated to be able to produce more? No. It is this absence uh, of knowledge about the other and the lack of inquiry about the other which produces what you call a dysfunctional environment. Well, what I always call alignment of purpose and vision becomes difficult levels in terms of perception. Because remember, the working environment is about 80% of your living life per day. The rest, when you get when you are there, that is your environment, that is your living space. The people that you work with become your friends, become your family. So the leaders must always look down and go down and hear how the other members of the family are doing. How can you be a leader in, in a house? You cannot even understand how your little young boy, last born out of five, is doing. We seem to be practicing things that we don't, we're not used to. At home, we become an empathetic leader. A leader who, who is sensitive, a leader who is aware. And yet when you come to work environment, we become another type of animal. This is where this, this, this dichotomy uh, is creating so much dislocation in the environment. This is the growth now. South Africa, in my view, this thing is going. We must learn to be who we are. At home. South Africa is going towards what you call empathetic leadership. Leadership that is, I think this is a word, transformation leadership, consultative leadership. That's where South Africa is going. But to empathetic leadership purpose, clear articulation of strategy and clear articulation of the method of execution. When you have those things clarified, we must learn to be parameters within the limits. This is the growth now. South Africa leadership, leadership but within parameters of the everything becomes difficult. The difficulty we have are, for instance, in the state-owned entities is that purpose Clarification of purpose all over the place. Uh, strategy for execution all over the place. In that sort of setting, you find all these, you know, uh, disrupting 
uh, things, uh, uh, you know, con confrontations with the trade unions, etc. When in fact, the trade unions should be operating on the same paradigm as the trade unions in Germany, working together to achieve organizational objectives. I hope I've answered your question, you know, uh, Christo. I think we've, we've missed some of it. There was an interesting piece that, that sounded specifically uh, intriguing and that, that is where you spoke about the moment in, in South Africa where we go, what, what this moment in South Africa is. Um, but I don't necessarily, uh, I, I, I think the long, it, it, does, it does answer the question uh, it, it almost brings us back to this question of the paternalistic paradigm, the paradigm of domination and the paradigm of control and, the, and that that is in itself, in a way, it seems a paradigm that is bound to lose its greater purpose. The purpose gets diminished to control domination for the sake of domination, winning for the sake of winning. Uh, and it is, it, it, uh, in, in a way, this style, this paternalistic style is a style that has become disconnected from our humanity. And I think we're looking to, we're look, looking to feminine styles, to Ubuntu, uh, and so on, to, as, as, ways, as ways back into the human and into the human aspect of organization. Yes, you see, the, 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 you're raising a, a very important, important part, uh, Christo, in the sense that we, we are in a very fluid situation. We're in a very fluid situation. And we're trying to find out exactly where the logical center should be so that we can then move together. It will take time. But uh, more effort has to be made to try to understand the essential elements from the different perceptions of society so that we can move together. Uh, we must not think that one part of society will come with answers. We must be more inclusive, pick up the dominant themes and go with them. This is this is this is the you know the challenge I think that we have at the present moment. I hope I've been able to clarify that. Yes, and I think I think you're giving us much much food for thought, uh, much to think about. <laughs> And what you also give sometimes, and, I, and, and, and it's amazing because a while back we had another uh, early consultant here from, from Israel and uh, he said South Africa, it's going to take so long. Uh, and and you, this mention that you made from social anthropology that attitude change is generational. I think sometimes we sit here and we we impatient and we get disheartened that our efforts don't seem to make progress fast enough. Uh, and then we think of, uh, are we busy with the right stuff? We, because it doesn't seem to have the right impact. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, it's important to be reminded that in some way we are working on the right stuff. We must persevere here. It's going to take a long time. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 these are social issues, and uh, from what I've learned about, you know, is that it, 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 it takes time. As I said, there are generational questions here, and there are attitudes, and the attitudes were not formed of overnight. They were embedded over time in people's psyche. So, uh, uh, but with advocacy, 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 have a point of reference to start. The reason why I'm in this book really now is it's, 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 it can be a knowledge resource. 
it can be knowledge resource. Uh, you read the first chapter, you go back and think, and you can visit another chapter, etc. It's a knowledge resource to trigger discussion. I would like to trigger discussion across a wider space. So the more people talk about it, I mean, that's fine. That's the legacy that I will leave. Uh, it's about really opening up the space for more discussion and disallowing ourselves from being closeted in our, what you call, um, parochial, parochial attitudes and environments. There's more I should learn from you, Christo, and you learning from me and from another person, etc. This is the essence. South Africa, the, the question that somebody raised, I think the rainbow question, I, I think it has been nice. That rainbow thing was good at a particular point. Let's let, let's 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 forget about that. Uh, we must recognize ourselves as different cultures and respect the cultures. What has been happening in the past 300 years is that other cultures were disrespected and ignored. When you do that, you are fighting the being of a person. Okay. What you need to do is to go back human, respect the cultures, and accommodate them. Learn from each other, all right? And pick up the things that can then formulate this new mental approach to society. But that won't change who you are in terms of how you look. I'll remain black, you remain white. But we must be able, I must be able to understand the tipping points about you. And you must be able to understand the tipping points about me and then find a way of understanding. So South Africa, as I say, for me, is the most wonderful case study in terms of leadership, in the sense that it is highly diverse, very diverse, all right? In thinking, in paradigm, I'm now in the Western Cape, and I'm telling you, I'm looking every day, I look at the West, at the Capetonians, I say, the way they behave, the way they think. And I say, what's wrong with you people, you know? And yet, when I go to Devon, I find a similar stuff, different people. And I want to know the West. So something says, first of all, respect people. Learn from them. Pick Be, let it be and strengthen it as much as possible, all right? And this is something that has been missing and we're struggling, we have, we're in a flux in terms of leadership style. We're trying to find out exactly what is the best way of doing it. But somewhere there, that's why I said, if you look at the leadership lessons from church, you will find something to take from that may help us build a society that we would like to be. Okay. Thank you, Tamang. Nathaniel, you want to uh, just speak about the comments that you just made about what, how? Uh... Uh, yes. Um... I was just saying that uh, one of the dangers that we hold, talking about uh, leadership uh, styles, is that uh, that is what most of our leaders ha have been schooled in. They have been trained a lot. They will recite them like uh, the, the Lord's Prayer. But exactly. the basic thing of understanding who am I, where am I, what is my leadership, where do I want to, where do I want to go, starting mm -hmm. from within myself and making mm -hmm. that shift in myself first before I start looking at anybody else. That is where the crux of the matter is. And maybe for us, um, when um, when I listened to you, especially in these discussions, 
I, I admit that I haven't read your book. I'm promising to to <laughs> buy and read. Um, but uh, I I got the feeling that we are talking of the what, but the problem also sits squarely on how do we how how are these people how can they transform themselves to get there starting from within themselves that is where i see the problem is uh, <clears throat> you're raising you're raising a very important issue and uh, let me address it this way let me address it this way as i said the emerging the emerging and preferred leadership style now is one of awareness awareness I call it contextual intelligence it is preceded by humility you must be humble now self-awareness says I know I can only go up to so far uh, if I want to be somewhere else I need an injection of knowledge what type of knowledge do I get? Can I learn from guy who's working on the same floor with me? Can I learn from someone downstairs, etc.? This is the essence of it. The essence is that self-awareness, the insight as you talk, and then awareness. One of the things that was published last week, by the way, is about uh, the success or the critical importance of meditation in developing desirable leadership. Meditation to set off and consult yourself and try to understand yourself, open up to others. So, as I say, the fraternity of leadership thinking is coming with all sorts of things. But I do agree, meditation is one of those. It's a must. It sort of makes you to be a calm person. A person who has, can now be in a position to listen, to listen, to listen to others. Remember, command and control has a very low level of listening. Command control is about dictating, telling. So for you to abandon command and control, it means you have to lower your level of ego. You know, this testosterone fire attitude, the level of ego must come down so that you can. And this is why the women leaders have no trouble about that. You know, they can listen to it. But we, we have this testosterone driven ego that says, oh, I'm the macho guy. So we need to do that. Be humble, listen, and then when you've listened, integrate. Not everything, but to say what can, and then go back and say, I have observed the following about you. Do you hold this view so important? Do you hold this feeling so important? How can we take that now and drive a unity of purpose? Because the whole thing about organizations is about unity of purpose. Because if you don't have an alignment of purpose, you cannot achieve organizational objectives and vision. And this is my teaching. My teaching is that the, pep the, the point of fit for purpose me means alignment at all those levels. You can't do it if you're a narcissistic person, if you are ego-driven, if you don't listen, much, if you are impatient, you can't do it. You have to have all those things. This is why the, the new way of thinking, they are calling it awareness as a meta skill. I'm calling it contextual intelligence. And others will say, but you must also have empathy. All right? You must have sensitivity. What's the difference between sensitivity and awareness? That's another thing. You know? For me, you're talking about the same thing. Empathy. Empathy means understanding the other party and uh, trying to get into the shoes of the other person. Because, as I said, at the work situation, we all come from different directions. I don't know the shoes you're working on until I can ask. 
I hope I've clarified, amplified your, your, your good point, absolutely good point. Thank you. I think, uh, the, the, Eddie, the comment that you made uh, around our psychology uh, ties in very much into this. The, the, how, how st our inner psychology or our inner drives, our inner fears, our in, inner needs for safety and control, how in some cases it predisposes us to patriarchal uh, leadership. I'm, I'm always thinking of that study that they did in the US where they saw that uh, people like in the presidential campaigns, they like the more human leader, but they tend to vote for the bully uh, in many cases. There's, uh, there's often that that's sort of thing that happens, so especially when the crisis deepens, people uh, seem to revert to the alpha dog style. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm interested in the way that, that you know, self-awareness is, is the work that we need to do to become aware of how we are driven by Mind drives, needs, patterns, etc., etc. Uh, the things that keep us from entering into the shoes of the other. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing about entering the shoes of the other <clears throat> that I've discovered is that is one of fear, uh, suspicion, and so on. You know, because we were so disjointed, it is difficult to try to understand how it is to walk in the shoes of the other. That's why I call it a generational issue. And the best way to do it is through workshop at, in the business environment under different topics so that you can gradually mold a team that is empathetic of each other's situations and then can then be aligned. I've seen that in actual practice, you know, in the, you know, company that I write about in the book, it is quite there. So, so if you read that story there, you'll see it coming out. Uh, you need to do it at the workplace over time, you know, once a month, etc. over time. And then these things begin to come up, you will see people's attitude changing. You begin to see people taking off their own working environment and working towards the objectives that have all been agreed have to be achieved. But I think fear is the is the thing because of the separation. You know that has been there, and that's the great cultural work that that, that we face in organisations. Absolutely. Ingrid, uh, you wrote quite a long comment there. Um, I'm wondering, are you saying that advocacy is good, but we need action too? Uh. My question is, you spoke about um, a level of intensity a little bit earlier, and that was when I wrote that comment, is, you know, continuing advocacy and intensity around that. And um, at that point in the conversation, we were talking about also, you know, this question of more empathic leadership and demanding it, both nationally, more accountable uh, leadership as well, demanding it nationally and in our organizations. And just you know, my observation over a long time is, is the weakening of civil society and the disempowering of those voices. And I just wonder what your perspective is on that, on the kind of organization of the left and civil society in demanding more empathic leadership, more accountable leadership, more pro-poor leadership. I think, I think, I think we are into a, a space that I'm very, very uh, sensitive about uh, in the sense that 
you'll find it throughout my book. I'm very sensitive about that. My point of departure is the following, that a political party must necessarily, in the South African context, perhaps in other contexts as well, adopt a philosophy in the sense that espouses the highest level of versus departure is the following, but in other contexts as well, social justice. There is no need to appropriate that for themselves. It's a general philosophical thing. When you have accepted that, Sorry, when you have accepted that, we lost you there. You said the highest level of, and then you broke up, so I missed something mostly. Very okay. The highest level of consciousness for social justice as a political philosophy. Because when you do that, it means you become sensitive in all cases to the conditions of the less privileged and the poor. Ignore those things that are painful to others. You are creating an escape route, a loophole for you, an excuse. Why can't you do that? As long as, if you accept that, then I'll find an easy way to program before me, a program of action for the next I'll find it easy to say, oh, okay, you're working towards that. The only limitation you have is the budget. But you're conscious of my situation and you are building towards that. That is what all politicians in South Africa fail to have. They are refusing to accept that as a political philosophy because it will bind them to scrutiny. The, 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 the nation, the citizens will say, you want your accountability. How then did you ignore this? How did you do that? How did you do the other thing? Accountability is one thing that is absolutely missing in our environment at the current moment. We have to build towards that. But we must understand also that the institutions of enforcement of accountability were literally and therefore, we're in a rebuilding phase. But what I'm, what I'm trying to advocate for is that the other groups out there must keep on hammering, you know, all the time. Uh, ground up, Section 27, uh, and so on. They're doing incredible work. Uh, it is they who actually bring issues to the fore. There's another organization, I just forget what it is, that goes around hospitals to check whether the hospitals are run uh, to the level and standards that is expected, etc. I just forget. They're doing an amazing work and they need to be funded. They should be funded, you know, so they can do more work because there is no way the state can do everything. And um, my appeal is to, to all those who have been gifted with the fortune of deep wealth, to think about these organizations, uh, help them set up good accounting controls and accountability systems and fund them because they are the eyes and our ears of society for the, those that are on the margins and those that are uh, poor. Thank you, Tabang. Nikki says, perhaps you should send copies of your book to every minister in public office in South Africa, but I think <coughs> you may have done that. <laughs> <laughs> now they must read it. <laughs> and I think... Yeah, uh, I, hope they do. I hope they read it, at least. At least. 
Yeah. Well, and so and so will we. I look forward to reading both books. I I I think we've come to we've come to the end of our two hours. I want to thank you so much for uh, for uh, for what you brought here today. Your wisdom, uh, your deep experience, and your your deep humanity, your deep care for for, for organizations, for leadership, but above all, eventually, finally, for people. Uh, we, we, we feel really fortunate, grateful that we can have a voice like yours in our space. And I hope that we can continue this conversation. There's much, much to continue to have a conversation about so that we can so that we can continue to do this work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christo. I really would like to, to send my deep appreciation to your, to your participants, to your colleagues. It has been a very enlightening engagement. Uh, I'm not tired, as you can see. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was prepared emotionally. I'm going to have my breakfast. But I feel, uh, you know, it's been an enriching engagement and please ask all these influential people to read the book it's as simple as that it is not for my you know it is for it is for the people of South Africa let them read the book and uh, let's let's make sure that m more people read the book it is the only way we're going to to try that's my contribution to change a little contribution a very little one uh, there are others with more ideas more powerful ideas. But thank you very much and all the best to all of you. Thank you, Dam Lung. Thank you so much. Enjoy your breakfast. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, and thank I hope you, you stay warm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's sunshine outside today, sunshine, clearly. Mm. Ah, good. Yeah. I'm going for, I think I'm going for a walk with my wife now to go and Download what I've learned from all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Yeah. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks, bye, -bye. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Devon. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Mm, nice comments. Mm, very nice comments. Matlasi, are you still here?